And so last week, or last time I preached, I talked about the spirit of faith and having the spirit on the inside of us, the spirit of faith. And I talked about how people with the spirit of faith are breaking through and people without it are breaking down. Churches that have the spirit of faith, see, faith isn't just a decision to trust in God. It's an attitude that we have on the inside of us. And that when we trust in God, we'll have this attitude of positivity. We'll have this attitude of victory, this attitude of courage that will cause us to move forward and transform our world. Won't be a victim to our circumstances, but we'll partner with the Holy Spirit to change the world. And, and this week, I want to talk about just a real simple thought uh, this morning on how to live by faith. And how to use faith in every area of our life. Because God doesn't want us just to believe for these 90 minutes on a Sunday. In fact, if you read the New Testament, uh, even though gathering together like we heard last week is super important, that the Bible hardly talks about how we do this 90 minutes on a Sunday. Most of the New Testament covers how we live our everyday life. And God wants us to bring faith into our relationships, bring faith into our workplace, bring faith into our labor, bring faith into our business, bring faith into our parenting. Come on, you need a whole lot of faith when you're parenting, eh? Come on, God wants us to bring faith into every area of our life. And, and, um, and that's what I want to talk about this morning. Got a real simple thought, and it's simply how do we, how do we activate or, or operate in faith? It's simply faith sees, faith speaks, and faith acts. That's a simple message there. Faith sees, faith speaks, and faith acts. But here's the thing. It's one thing to be able to define something. And it's another thing to know how to use that. There's a whole bunch of people that can define what a car is. Probably most people in the room, hopefully most people in the room, if you can't define what a car is, my message, as simple as it is, probably is going to go over your head. But, but, you know, like most people can define what a car is, but not everyone can drive a car. So people can say a car has got four wheels, it it's, uh, drives on the road, gets you from A to B, it's a vehicle, um, you know, so, so people can define what a car is, but just because you can define it doesn't mean you can use it. People can define what a chainsaw is, just because you can define it doesn't mean you can use it. And it's the same with faith. I think Christians can define what faith is, but just because you can define what faith is, a wholehearted trust in Jesus, believing the gospel, you know, just because you can define what faith is doesn't mean you know how to use it. And I think in the church, there's a whole bunch of people that can define what faith is. Faith is being sure of what we hope for, being certain of what we can't see. We can define it, but just because you can define it doesn't mean you, can, you know how to use it. And, and I reckon there's a whole bunch of Christians that can define faith, but if they knew how to use faith, the world would be a different place. Hey, they'd be transforming their world. And so what I want to talk about just simply is how do we, how do we operate in faith? And the simple thought is, then we activate faith through seeing, through speaking, and through acting. Faith sees, faith speaks, faith acts. And we see these things all through the Bible. We see it in 1 Samuel 17, where David turns up to the battle with, um, with Goliath there. And everyone's looking at Goliath, and they're like, man, he's big, he's intimidating, he's going to kill us. That's what they see. David turns up, he sees something different. He says, here's an uncircumcised Philistine. In other words, here's someone who doesn't have God on their side. And David turns up, says, I've got God on my side. This guy doesn't have God on my side. I'm going to win. He sees something different to what everyone else sees. Then what does he do? He starts speaking different. He says, come on, today I'm going to cut your head off with your own sword and I'm going to hold it up to the birds of the air and the wild beasts, they're going to feed on the carcasses of your army and everyone will know that there's a God in Israel. Come on, that's what I'm talking about right there, eh? Good day to talk a bit of smack. I love it. I feel justified. David's talking smack. I feel justified. And so, but he starts talking. Everyone is afraid and they're listening to the enemy. But David says, sometimes you got to talk back to the enemy. He starts speaking back to the enemy. I reckon there's a whole bunch of people getting smacked down in their faith because they need to start talking back to the enemy. Hey, need to start, don't just take it, sit there and take it, man. You got to talk back to the enemy. Come on, not today. Get off my family. Get off my finances. This is what God said is going to happen. And even though uh, I'm seeing something different, the word of God's going to come to pass in my family in Jesus' name. Start talking back to the devil. And, and then what does he do? He sees, he speaks. 
and then he acts. He runs towards Goliath, picks up a handful of stones, slings a stone, and it plunges into his forehand, and he kills the giant. Come on, we see this all throughout the Bible. I could tell you story after story of these three principles, that faith sees something different, faith speaks something different, and faith acts something different. That's how you live by faith. It starts with you seeing, which is why you've got to get intimate with Jesus. Because the only we can't teach you how to see something you can't see. But what we can teach you is how to draw near to Jesus. And when you draw near to Jesus, the, when you get intimate, things get conceived. Don't make me go into detail this morning, eh? But when you get intimate, that's why this season of prayer and fasting is so powerful. That's why we do it at the start of the year, eh? It's like we started off with 21 days. We moved to 14. I know you're all hoping for seven. But that's why fasting is so powerful because we're carving out, we're cutting off distraction from the world and we're praying and we're seeking God and we're drawing in. We're allowing God to conceive something in our heart that's actually going to cause us to speak different, that's going to cause us to act different. We see these things all through the Bible. We see it in Acts 14, for instance, where Paul is preaching to a group like this in a place called Lystra. And while he's preaching, the Bible says that Paul looks out and sees a guy with that was lame from birth. So he was probably carried into the meeting, put there on a mat. Paul looks out, he sees a lame guy, but he doesn't just see a lame guy. The Bible says specifically that Paul sees that he has faith to be healed. How does he see that? He's looking at a whole bunch of people, but God highlights one person and says, this person has faith to be healed. And so Paul, seeing that he had faith to be healed, said, stand up on your feet and walk. And then he spoke, and then the guy acted by jumping up on his feet, and he was healed, started praising God. Come on, you see it all through the Bible. We could go right through the whole Bible. Faith sees, faith speaks, and faith acts. Like that woman with, who had a, like a period problem for years and years in Mark chapter 5, and, and Jesus, she, she sees that if she could touch Jesus, she'd be healed. She's got no one to talk to, so she talks to herself. And she says, if I just touch him, I'll be healed. Come on, no one wants to hang. She's a social outcast. She hasn't even got anyone to talk to. You know? And so she just says, well, I'm just going to talk to myself. If I touch him, then I'll be healed. And she turns up and she presses through the crowd to touch the hem of his garment. And she gets, as soon as she touches him, power flows into her and she's healed. Come on, faith sees something, faith speaks something, and faith acts something. Come on, and when you do this, when you flow in faith, the, the amazing thing about the life of faith that God has called us into is it's not limited by our human limitations. Because st- then when we operate by faith, we step out of our humanity and our natural limitations into what's possible with God. We step out of what John can do in his own ability into the realm of God's grace and God's power where anything is possible. Come on, if that doesn't excite you, you're in the wrong place this morning. No, you're in the right place. Don't leave. So let's break these things down, eh? Simple message. First thought is, let me break down seeing. Faith sees, John 5, 19. The Bible says this, So Jesus said, I speak to you a timeless truth. Come on, I love that, just right there, eh? I speak to you a timeless truth, not just for back then. The son is not able to do anything from himself or through my own initiative. I only do the works that I see the father doing For the son does the same works as his father. So this whole life of faith, that's why the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That word word is the word rema. It's the word revelation. So faith faith kicks off. It starts in our life with the revelation. It starts when we we wait on God, when 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 we cut out distractions in our life like we're doing for these next 14 days and we just spend time waiting on God and we hear the voice of God. Come on, I'm always encouraged by preaching, but there's nothing like hearing the voice of Jesus. And I'm hoping you're hearing the voice of Jesus through preaching, but but there's something about just hearing from Jesus. It causes faith to come alive on the inside of us. And that's what Jesus said, is that faith starts. He says, I see, I understand or perceive something by revelation. You know, a couple of years ago, uh, you know, our staff team started growing and, and um, it's just been an amazing journey at Legacy, and we're continually so grateful for you and grateful for God and what God's done. It's been amazing. And, and, and our staff started growing, and, and um, I remember sitting down in a cabin out the back of our community center, 
talking to somebody and saying, what are we going to do? Like, because when you bring people on, you've got to have an office and you've got to have space for them. Eh? It's like bring people on and they're typing in their car because they're trying to get something happening. And so it's kind of, you've got to have faith to bring people on, but then you've got to have faith to create some space for them. Eh? And so, and we're like, man, what are we going to do? Where are we going to put people? And as I was sitting there, I just had this flash thought, Barrett and 114 Cuba Street. Just come, I just saw it, Barrett, 114 Cuba Street. And so got out of that meeting and I went to pick my phone up to ring Barrett and I looked at my phone and it said, missed call from Barrett two minutes ago. And so I rang him and I said, hey, you know, like, I'm sorry, missed the call. And, and he said, he said, oh, I said, what'd you call? He said, oh, I was just calling to say hi, no reason in particular. I said, well, I was calling to see if you could get us that building on 114 Cuba Street. <laughs> you know, like, I just think you got to, don't beat around the bush, eh? Come on, man, just straight to it, eh? And, um, and he said, well, funny thing is, I'm, I'm on the board that, is, that manages that property, that owns that property, and I'm just actually this moment walking into a meeting where we're talking about what we're going to do with 114 Cuba Street. Come on, how good is that? Come on, it gets better. Wait, it gets better. And so he goes into the, I said, oh, call me back. And he, he went into the meeting, called me back. He said, bro, you can have 114 Cuba Street for free. Come on, how what that's, and, and in case you're not excited by that, that's like a thousand square meters of real estate in the CBD that was given to us to say, hey, you can have it for free. That's a good time to clap right there. I reckon that's awesome, eh? That was better than the other time. Getting it for free is way better. <laughs> and, um, and we said to him, hey, we'll, we'll pay and we'll give you some money weekly. And, and um, we left that building in a way better state than what we got it in because we're all about the kingdom and that's what you do in the kingdom. Eh? And so like, we blessed them and they blessed us. But come on, that's a God thing. How did that start? That started through seeing something that I couldn't see. Faith isn't just for Sunday morning. Faith isn't just for casting out demons. Faith isn't just for healing the sick. Faith is for our everyday life. Faith is for your business. Faith is for your children. Come on, God wants to raise up parents that, that know what their kids are getting up to even when they don't think they know what they're getting up to, hey? How do you know, man? I got a direct line. You can't get away with anything in this household. I got a direct line. Let me go ask Jesus what you did, hey? Come on. I saw something, not with my natural eyes, but with my spiritual senses. Come on, what do you see? What do you see in your personal life? What do you see in this year? What do you see in your family? What do you see in your business? What do you see in your workplace? What do you see in your ministry? What are you seeing? Because faith starts with seeing. It's like in Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 15, God comes to Abraham, and Abraham is moaning and complaining. It's encouraging for me because I moan and complain sometimes. I know you guys never moan and complain, but... Anyway, I moan and complain sometimes. And um, not making an excuse for it, but it's still encouraging anyway, because God turns up to Abraham when he's saying, like God turns up and God says, behold, I'm your shield and your exceedingly great reward. And Abraham's going, and Abraham's first word, he doesn't even fall on the ground and worship. He's like, I got no children. That's the first thing he says, man. I got no children. How... I'm not blessed. You haven't blessed me. I don't even have a child. And everything I have is going to go to, my, to, like my, uh, to someone else, to my servant. And, and so God says, the first thing God says to Abraham is he says, I want you to go outside. In other words, he's saying, I want you to get out under that man, from under that man-made ceiling that you've created. And I want you to get out and I want you to look up at my ceiling. Because the things that you think are possible uh, uh, are nothing compared to what I think is possible. So you got to get you got to get rid of some limitations in your thinking, some some ceilings that you think I can't push through this. I could never do this. It's never been done in my family. I could never do. You don't know me, Pastor. I could never do that. Come on, get out from under that man-made ceiling. Who put that limitation on you? Who built that ceiling? You got to get out from what man says is possible under the the expanse of God. And he says, first, I want you to look up. Because the enemy's trying to get us looking down. He's trying to weigh you up with shame and weigh you up with guilt and weigh you up with fear and weigh you up with discouragement and weigh you up with depression so that you 
walk around looking down on the ground. Come on, but even then you see the sand on the ground, which is still the promise of God. Come on, everywhere you look, you're going to see the promise of God because he says, as high as the stars in the sky and, the, and as many as the, the, the sand on the ground. And he said, I want you to see something different. And the Bible says, Abraham believed God and it was credited for righteousness, which is a foundational scripture in the whole of the New Testament. That he just said, God, I'm going to take you at your word. I know it seems impossible. I mean, I'm past childbearing age. Sarah's past childbearing age. I know it seems impossible, and, but I'm going to believe you. And, and God says, okay, I want you to change your name. I want you to change your name from Abraham, from Abram to Abraham. And we read that and we think, oh, yeah, that's all good. Just there's a few rappers these days that change their name and a few kind of like artists that change their name. And, you know, people change their name all the time. And, but actually in the Hebrew language, the word Abram means father. And the word Abraham means father of nations. So here's a guy. I mean, if you're Abram, which means father, and you want children, but you haven't had children, how many people know that's a pretty embarrassing name to have? Like, hey, I want everyone to call me. Some people do call me Father John. I'm not encouraging it. I don't particularly like it. It started when the police came over in Highbury and said, hey, is Father John here? I think Jackie's changed my name on her Telegram chat to Father John, eh? Every time it comes up, and I'm like, do I look like Father John? Come on, man. Like, I don't even really look like a pastor. I definitely don't look like Father John. But, but how many people know if I'm like, hey, my name's Father, but I don't have any kids, that's pretty embarrassing. How many people know it's the next level of super embarrassment to go, actually, I still don't have any kids, but I want you to call me the Father of Nations. How do you think that's going to go down? You know, like, but what's God doing? Because God, God knows this is the principle of faith. That faith sees something, then faith speaks something. And God's saying to Abraham, I want you to start to speak the promise out over your life. In fact, every time people see you and they call your name, they're speaking the promise of God over your life. Even your haters are going to speak the promise of God when they're mocking you in the back room talking about Abraham. They're still speaking the promise of God over your life. See, God knows what he's doing because faith sees and faith speaks. Come on, there's something powerful about when you see something different and you begin to say something different. First thought this morning is that faith sees. Come on, what do you see? It's easier to see the messed up reality around you. It's easier to see what everyone's doing wrong. Some people come into church and they say, oh, I see this wrong, they see that wrong, they see this wrong. Come on, you don't need to be spiritual to see what's wrong but you do need to be spiritual to see what God is doing. It's easy to look at your, your family members and say, they're this, they're that, they're that, and you write them off. But actually, God wants us to see something different, to begin to speak something different, and then begin to act in a different way. First thought, faith sees. Come on, you getting something this morning? I feel like I'm sweating up here. I am sweating up here. Feeling tropical. <coughs> Second thought is that faith speaks. Come on, what's coming? What are the words that are coming out of your mouth? Words aren't just about communication, they're also about creation. First time we see words in the Bible was when God said, you know, like, let there be light. And, and God wasn't talking to anyone because there was nobody around. You know, so God's speaking and He's creating with His words. Come on, your words are powerful. The words of faith are powerful. In fact, I reckon some people's promotion is being blocked because of the words that they're speaking. Because when you're promoted in the spirit, your words have more weight. And sometimes you wouldn't want more weight to be on some of your words. Hey, some of your words, you're like, I don't know if I want more weight on some of those words that I'm speaking. So God is merciful. He just keeps you where you are until you can learn to change your language. And then he says, oh man, now I can put some more weight on your words. Come on, that those words can actually have weight in the spirit. Is that what, that's what we need, not more work, but more weight. Yeah. That's why Jesus spoke to the storm and his words had weight, bang, something happened. And so our words are powerful. Mark eleven twenty two. 22, the, the Bible says, Jesus said, have faith in God. 
Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and doesn't doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, come on, this is Jesus. This isn't hyper faith teaching. This is just reading scripture to you this morning. He says, if they believe in their heart that what they say will happen, it'll be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you've received it and it'll be yours. Come on, that's the power of faith right there. The Christian life is, is lived. The, the bedrock of the Christian life is our relationship with God is based on faith. And, and this is faith in action. It's faith in action through our words. And Jesus is walking down the road. He's hungry, like some of you guys after skipping breakfast this morning or um, eating vegetables if you're on the Daniel fast or whatever, I don't know, or even just not started yet, but thinking about it and you're still hungry. And, um, and Jesus is hungry, so he sees a fig tree and it's the season for figs. So he walks up to it, and it's got leaves, but it's got no fruit. And that's a picture of religion. See, religion's got works, but no life. It's got, it's got form, but no power. And Jesus isn't happy with that. He's upset. He's obviously hangry by this stage, and he's like, hey, man, like, may no one ever eat fruit from you ever again. And he walks away. And then the disciples are walking past the tree the next day, And Peter says, Master, the tree that you cursed has withered from the roots. It's lying there, shriveled up. This tree had come out, it's withered. You must have been able to see the roots. The whole thing just shriveled up from the roots. And that's the power of our words, because Jesus didn't go up to that tree and say, I curse you, tree, in Jesus' name. He didn't say that. He just spoke something negative over the tree and and curse was released and, and that thing began to shrivel from the inside. I know that's challenging for me because I think about how many negative words do I say about things in my own life and, and, and maybe I'm praying for some things to be blessed and then coming out of my prayer closet and some things are actually shriveling because what I say isn't consistent with what I'm praying. And so Jesus started to teach them about the power of our words and the power of faith and the power of seeing something different and speaking something different. He says, have faith in God. If you say to this mountain, be cast into the sea and don't doubt, you'll have whatever you say. What's he saying? He's saying that our faith is exercised through our words. I was down in Levin last Sunday. Pastor Aaron's down there preaching it up, probably right about now and or getting into it. And I was down there last Sunday and... Um, I was preaching on signs that you're under spiritual attack. I did this kind of response for prayer and like about 20 people came up. It was awesome. And, but there's not a big prayer team down there. In fact, Pastor Jay was on the, on the prayer response, and, which is awesome. We celebrate that. You never want to be too proud that you can't come up to an altar call in church. Hey? When I did that, I remember God just convicted me. I was in a church meeting and, and there was an altar call. And I'm like, man, I should be there, but I'm a pastor. And I'm like, mate, that's a good time to slap yourself right there and say, come on, that's even more reason I need to be up the front that I think that I shouldn't be up the front because of my position in the church, eh? Anyway, I'm down there, just throw that in for free, and I'm down there, and I'm praying. And so I'm going along praying for people, people getting touched, it's awesome. And I get to this lady, this is last week, I pray for her, and she's like, go away. She just did that on the altar call. And I'm thinking, why'd you come up here in the first place? <laughs> Let me to make you come up here. <laughs> you came up of your own free will. No, I knew it was a spirit. And she said, it's, I'm go away. And then she said, I am lust. And she said, I am stronger than you. Like this woman, she was like, full on going hard. I'm like, yeah, come on. I love this stuff, man. I love it. Hey, I don't know. It's church. We're having church right now. And uh, quietly in my mind, I'm like, man, Lord, there's 20 people up here. I'm the only guy praying for people. I ain't got heaps of time, man. Help me out. Help me out. So I just said, you're a lying spirit. Get out of here in Jesus' name. I went on to the next one. I just prayed for that person and <laughs> forgot all about her. <laughs> prayed for the next one. Prayed for the next one and went on a little bit. She come up afterwards and she said, hey, when you prayed for me, something instantly left me. And she said, man, I just feel like this tingling all over my body. Come on, can we give Jesus a good praise for that? Come on, it's a lady set free by the power of God. But how did that happen? It just happened through seeing. 
shooting up a quick prayer of desperation. <laughs> like, help me out, Jesus. Come on. I don't even think I prayed it. I just thought it. But you know my thoughts, Jesus. <laughs> and then speaking something. Come on, just speaking something. And when you speak things, you've got to realize that when you speak things in faith, those words are powerful. Come on, demons have to obey that in the name of Jesus. Come on, we've got to get back to some simple things in the church, like the power of the name of Jesus. Come on, we get all clever and sophisticated. But man, come on, there's no substitute for the power of the name of Jesus. Come on, demons have to leave at the name of Jesus. And there's something powerful about just speaking in faith. We see it all through the Bible. I mean, Lazarus dies and Jesus perceived that the sickness wouldn't end in death. And so, like they send him a text message and they're like, hey, Jesus, your mate, who, Lazarus, who you love, Like, they're laying it on thick, man. It's like, you're Lazarus who you love. He's sick. Come quickly. And so Jesus like, I'm going to hang out for a couple more days, man. eh? Man, God is just his own boss, eh? He just does whatever he pleases, whenever he pleases. And he's like, I'm going to hang out for a couple more days. But he knows that the sickness isn't going to end in death. And he turns up and Lazarus is dead. You know what would have happened if he stood there at the grave and said nothing and did nothing? Nothing would have happened, but he didn't. He said, he stood there, and with a loud voice, he said, Lazarus, come forth. Boom, and that dead body heard the sound of his words, of words of faith, and life started to come back on the inside of him, and he comes out of that. They rolled the stone away. They acted. They did something. Bang, and and Lazarus walked out of there, and a live man. Come on, we see it all through the Bible. What's coming out of your mouth? What are you seeing? about your future? What are you seeing about your environment? You might be in a mess. Things might be tragic. But what do you see that God is doing? There's a whole bunch of people in there. They're studying up on the internet what the devil's doing. I'm like, man, and they're like, hey, this is happening in the world. That's happening, and this is happening. And I ain't going to live the one life I've got studying what the enemy's doing. I'm going to live my life focused on what God is doing, looking intently at the Father so that I can cooperate with God in my life. Thanks so much for tuning in today. We hope you've enjoyed the program. Legacy is in an amazing season. We're seeing phenomenal things happen on a weekly basis. And we're incredibly grateful for the many people that partner with us. People that sow into our ministry financially, people that pray for us, and people that serve on the front lines. If you'd like to partner with us, you can visit us online. Have a fantastic day.